Island. That's a word that most people should understand. Well, technically that's an English word, so those who don't speak English might not understand. But I'm pretty sure each language have their own word for island. And yes, if you have been looking at the screen, you are looking at an island. And this image is also an island. But did you know, if we're looking at this image with a zoologic perspective, there are at least two islands in this image. This one is obvious, the other one is this one. Now, some of you might be confused. So, let me bring up the question. What exactly is island? If you look at dictionaries, the definition of island is an area of land, smaller than a continent, which is surrounded by water. Well, to be fair, different dictionaries might have different definitions. But most of them are basically stating the same thing, something similar to the definition that I stated earlier. That's also the island that most of you would think of, right? Now, what about continent though? The definition of island is basically just a smaller continent, right? So, at what point would a landmass be considered a continent and not just an island? Where do you put the line exactly? Well, I don't think an exact size limit currently exists. But that's a topic for geographer. Zoologists don't really need to think about that. Why? Because, functionally, a continent and an island serve the same purpose. Well, not exactly, because the scale is usually very different, so if we're talking about specifics, the differences would matter, you know? But anyway, if it's not obvious enough, zoologists are quite generous in categorizing a thing as island. To be precise, functional island. Think about it like this. The island definition that I talked about earlier is made by human. And we, humans, are mostly land dwellers. That's why the landmass is the center of our attention. That's our domain. And the water is just the barrier. Now, think about it like this. What if you are an aquatic creature? The water would be your main attention. That would be your domain. And the landmass would be the barrier. And so, let's take a look at the image that I showed earlier. This one. If you are a freshwater creature, let's just say you are a fish, this lake would be an island for you. Because this is an isolated area for you, a freshwater body that is disconnected from rivers, or other kind of freshwater body. So yeah, functionally, this is indeed an island, at least in zoology. This is not just limited to the realm, by the way. It's not just about landmass versus water body. Some animals are dependent on specific resources, which in turn limit their distribution. For example, this tree. By the way, a little disclaimer before I continue. This image is just a random wallpaper I found on the internet. I'll just use this for a hypothetical example. So, let's say there is an animal that somehow cannot live without this tree species. Maybe an insect that is specialized in consuming the tree sap. Or, you know, maybe a lizard that is specialized in consuming an insect that is specialized in consuming that specific tree sap. Or whatever the reason might be, really. You get the point. Actually, if you've played Monster Hunter Wilds and you collected all of the endemic lives, you should know that the prism herculerum can only be found in one specific tree. In this case, that tree is an island. In case you are wondering, Yes, there are real-world cases where some isolated trees are considered island. Zoologically speaking, of course. I'm not just making a hypothetical example without any basis, you know. But now, the question is, why is that, in this scenario, the insect didn't just, you know, move away, fly away, maybe look for another tree of the same species? There could be a garden full of sage species, you know. That would be great for that insect right? So why would this lone tree become an island? What exactly is the barrier? Well, to put it simply, the barrier is nothing or nothingness, the non-existence of what's necessary. It's actually quite easy to understand if you put yourself in the insect's place. I'll make an analogy to make it easier to understand. But before that, Okay, so let's say you are stranded on an island. You have no idea where you are. However, 
This island does have things that you could eat. The island does have clean water for you to drink. Now, picture yourself on the edge of this island. Look at the horizon. How easy would it be for you to decide whether you want to leave this island right away or not? You know, maybe if you swim a bit, you'll find civilization. That could happen, right? Indeed. But the other possibility could also happen. That is, you ran out of resources in your body to survive, and you cannot make it to the other side. You'll just basically die on the way. Even if you want to try swimming for a bit and then just swims your way back to the island if you don't see anything, are you even sure you could find your way back to the island? What if you get lost? Now, that's a significantly more difficult choice to make if you are not a pro swimmer. So, let's say you could build a raft. Some of you had probably seen some survival guide, played a survival game, watched some movies or whatever, right? So, at least the idea could come to your mind. But still, if you're actually in that scenario, would you actually do it? Maybe after some preparation, but how much preparation would you do? Etc, etc. Actually, you don't even need to imagine yourself in such scenario. You could just look at your daily life. Ask yourself this. How likely it is for you to just randomly go deep into the forest, or perhaps explore the desert, or something like that? Most of you wouldn't, unless you have some specific goals, I guess. Even if, let's say, I told you there is a cool place beyond the forest, I'm pretty sure some of you wouldn't dare crossing the forest just to get to that cool place. So yeah, if you think about it, that's pretty understandable, right? Now that you've tried putting yourself in the animal's perspective, let's try putting yourself in a zoologist's perspective. Why would you need to classify such specific things as islands? Are there any benefits or some kind of implications by categorizing those as islands? Well, the answer is, yeah, there is. Let's talk about island biology a little bit. In biology, there are terms called island biogeography and island ecology. Those are theories based on empirical evidence, which was made by observing organisms on islands. Some examples that are quite famous are island gigantism and island dwarfism. Island gigantism is a phenomenon where animals on isolated islands have increased size compared to the inland population. For example, the Komodo dragons. Meanwhile, island dwarfism is the opposite, where animals on isolated islands have decreased size compared to the inland population. For example, Rukesia, the dwarf chameleon from Madagascar which I already made a video about them by the way, so check it out if you're curious. Anyway, these theories apply to the other islands that I talk about in this video. For example, some fishes that live in isolated water body grows bigger compared to the population in bigger water system, like this case in the nine spine sticklebacks, where the population that live in pond grows faster and reach bigger size compared to the ones in lakes and marine environment. So, the reason why the theory could apply to such cases is because what's significant about the actual island itself is not the fact that it's an island by definition. What's significant is the fact that it is an isolated habitat. In an isolated area, animals are forced to adapt, or they just die, you know? That leads to changes, which, of course, leads to evolution. This is supported by the fact that said population is isolated from others, which means they could only reproduce with each other. And so, if there are changes caused by adaptations to the environment or simply random mutation, there is a higher chance of said changes being preserved. So yeah, that's why, a lot of the time, insular populations can be significantly different. And of course, like I said, same logic applies to the non-literal islands like isolated trees or isolated water body. That's the way it is. Which is why those kinds of isolated habitats like lakes or isolated trees are functionally islands. Still, if a zoologist says island, most of the time we're still talking about the actual literal island. This video doesn't serve as an um actually moment. I just want to talk about the concept which might be unheard of for many people. So, if you see an isolated tree in the middle of nowhere, try checking it out. 
you might find something interesting on it. Not guaranteed, of course. But yeah, that's all for now. Oh, by the way, I would like to remind you that the island rules is not exactly a hard fact. There are many factors that could influence animals to evolve in such way, so you shouldn't use the island theory willy-nilly. Anyway, enjoy your day.